this is Robert Stearns. Hey, I want to thank you for tuning in. I really believe that learning is one of the greatest joys in life. And one of the greatest ways to learn is simply to have meaningful conversations, both with those who come from a similar background as yours, as well as those whose background might be very different. So my hope is that as we connect and converse with leaders from all around the world, that we will learn and grow together. If you're new with us, hit the subscribe button and we'll deliver the new episodes to you right away. So wherever you are, on a run, in the car, at the kitchen table with some coffee, welcome to the conversation. Well, good evening, my dear friends, lovers of Israel, lovers of the Word of God, students of Scripture and history. Good evening, everyone. We have got Baltimore in the house. We have Delaware in the house. We have uh, Columbus, Indiana. Uh, We have Southern California, coastal North Carolina. Midland, Pennsylvania, Bolingbrook, Illinois, folks from all over the country. Uh, do a favor for us right now and sign in. Uh, give us your name. Uh, it's especially helpful to me tonight if you will sign in. Um, since uh, I'm not in studio, it'll help me to see uh, who's here. New Jersey is here. God bless you, New Jersey. So we've got a great and wonderful night uh, together, and we're so glad that you've tuned in. And I I hope that this is all working, even though I am coming uh, at you uh, from outside where we normally are. Well, we are so excited uh, to welcome tonight Rabbi Jason Herman, who is uh, the spiritual leader of the Hudson Yards Synagogue, right in the heart, folks, right in the heart of New York City. Uh, and all that New York City has gone through. Uh, what an incredibly challenging year for New York and so many fronts. Um, and Hashem has put Rabbi uh, Jason there as a, a spiritual leader for such a time as this. Uh, he's got a distinguished um, uh, uh, resume uh, of accomplishments. Uh, we know him through our dear friend, uh, Rabbi Joseph Potasnik, who has been on this show several times. And, uh, and he uh, serves with Rabbi Potasnik in different capacities, and he also serves as the executive director of the International Rabbinic Fellowship, uh, an organization of over 250 Orthodox rabbis from around the United States and around the world. And so many, I could go on and on of, of just pages of his um, accomplishments, but I know that from the first moments that you begin to connect and hear his heart and hear his uh, his spirit, um, that you're going to connect with him and learn from him. So everybody give a big Eagle's Wings welcome to uh, Rabbi Jason Herman as he welcomes, as he joins us tonight. Rabbi, thank you for taking your time to be with us this evening. Thank you, Bishop Stearns. It's really an honor for me to be here and uh, welcome everyone. Good evening and a special shout out to my home state in New Jersey, I heard you announce and just really greetings from the heart of New York City. Uh, it's just a pleasure to be with all of you around the country. If it's your first time, hit the um, uh, let us know that you're you're on uh, a first time. And folks, you've got one job tonight. You know what that job is? Hit the share button. All right. If you've not yet done that, hit the share button and let's fill the room up. Let's invite everyone in. Rabbi, you know we've learned as we've studied with so many uh, luminaries uh, from the rabbinic world. Uh, We've learned that when we engage the Torah and we engage the word of God with sincere hearts uh, to study, to learn, to to draw close to God. Well, Rabbi, take us into the word of God. We're going to study tonight. The Torah portion is Bamidbar, Bamidbar, which for us Gentiles is Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter one through four, uh, chapter one through four. And uh, we're in this moment, folks. Uh, They've come out of Egypt. And uh, they've received um, uh, they've received this call to come across the desert, and they find themselves in the book of Numbers. Rabbi, take it away from us and bring us yeah. through these first three or four chapters of the book of Numbers. What are the lessons that we should be learning and understanding from this portion of Scripture? Right, thank you for the you know the introduction again. 
So as you said, we're starting a new book today. And new books, you know, should give us the opportunity to focus on new themes. As you said, the book in Hebrew is called the Midbar, which is often translated as numbers. Uh, but the name numbers is actually not a direct translation of the Midbar, but rather comes from a drashic name of the book, which was Sefer Hamis Parim, the book of numbers. The word Bamidbar itself, however, means wilderness or desert. Hmm. Most of the rest of the book, we're going to see stories that happened to the Israelites as they traveled through the desert, leaving Mount Sinai, which is where we've been since the end of the book of Exodus, throughout all of the book of Leviticus, the first couple of chapters of Bamidbar and Numbers were still at the base of Mount Sinai, and now going to begin this journey through the wilderness all the way until you get to the promised land in Canaan. And what is it about wilderness that actually in Hebrew we name the book, you know, after the wilderness? And the wilderness is really this in-between space. It's not the world of Egypt that we left and tried to get away from, but we're not yet in the promised land. Mm. There's something that happens in between. And when you're in that space kind of in between, like also places in life, it's sometimes the in-between space that some of the greatest spiritual transformations can take place. You know, whether you're personalized, maybe it's, you know, not when you're in one job or the next job, but someone's between jobs, you know, might have some real revelation. Someone between different family states can have different things happen to them. And that's where real transformation takes place. I think we in our society are also kind of in the in-between state, you know, where you just spent the last year and a couple months, year and a quarter faced with this horrific pandemic and our lives were completely changed. You know, and today we have the announcement that for those who are vaccinated, we're able to start resuming, you know, real semblance of normal life, but we know it's not entirely there yet. So we're probably in this in-between stage. Mm -hmm. We're not still in the world of the pandemic, and yet we're not really in the post-pandemic life either. But I think the word Bamidbar and actually the lessons of the book are calling out to us to make use of this in-between time. It's this time in between that we actually can really transform our lives and see this uh, spiritual transformation. So I think that's the first lesson just from the name of the book and what's going to happen you know, over the course of the entire book. You know, and Rabbi, if I can, if I can just interject for a moment, and this is why I think it's so important, uh, you know, folks, you've got to get to Israel. Every single Christian, at least once in your life, you have to purpose in your heart that you're going to go up and you're going to experience um, the land of the Bible because it changes, you know, everything. And Rabbi, you're talking about wilderness and and I always reflect back whenever I hear that wilderness phrase, I think about the drive. And if you've been with me to Israel, first of all, if you've been with me to Israel, just type in, in there in the chat. Say, I've been, I've been to Israel with, with Bishop. Um, uh, but I think about the drive if we're going down to the Dead Sea and you drive from Jerusalem. You start in Jerusalem. You wake up. You're in this beautiful hotel. You've got your big Israeli breakfast. Everything's nice. Your lime is green. The flowers are blooming. Everything's great. And you get in your big air-conditioned bus and you start to drive. And all of a sudden, you know, 45 minutes, an hour outside of the city, all of a sudden you start to see the terrain really start to change. Uh, you know, the, the foliage starts to change. The trees become more sparse. And, you know, and especially if you've been, because normally people are jet lagged, so they might, you know, fall asleep for 15 minutes, then wake up. And you wake up and it's like you're on Mars. I mean, you are in, you're in total wilderness. It is total desert. But Rabbi, every time I'm there, I think to myself, how many of the people in the word of God, in, he's, he is the God of the desert. I mean, we really see in scripture, time after time, after time, after time, Hashem encounters us. Hashem speaks to us in the desert. Moshe is there and the bush is burning and he draws aside to see the, you know, the burning bush. Um, uh, Avraham, here's the voice, Lechacha, you know, go into the wilderness and I, I'm going to show you the way to go. And all of the prophets. And then for us, Jesus, how many times in our Christian scriptures, Jesus pulls away into the wilderness. And Rabbi, I think what you're telling us is that uh, the wilderness doesn't have to literally be 
the physical wilderness, but there's something spiritually important about unplugging from distractions, right. unplugging from all of the stuff and, and just going to that still place and that quiet place and, and, and hearing the voice of Hashem there. I, th I think that's one, certainly for sure, as you said, rightfully said, just, you know, getting away from distractions. And, uh, you know, it just reminds me of actually of a beautiful midrash uh, that actually, you know, we're going to be celebrating the giving of the Torah. And, you know, Moses, when he comes down the mountain, he talks about his face radiating. Right, right. And the midrash that asked the question, said, from where did Moshe get that glow from? And it gives three different answers. The first, it says that he got the, the glow from the cave. And he was in a cave on top of Mount Sinai. It's the same cave that Elijah is going to visit. And I actually believe in the New Testament, Jesus also goes into the you know, cave in mm -hmm. Talmudic literature, Shimon Bar Yochai, the founder of Kabbalah, who's buried on Mount Meron, where we saw this horrible tragedy mm -hmm. you know, just a few weeks ago, also lived in a cave for 12 years. It's in the cave that you're you know, completely alone. And, you know, if you think about how much in modern society do we really have an opportunity to really just be, you know, completely alone and just to appreciate the solitude, you know, to tune everything out and hear that. Uh, and so the Midrash actually posits that just Moshe from just having that space of contemplation of being alone, you know, was able to glow, uh, to able to glow and have his face radiate and shine. It came from the cave. Second, I think also the notion of the Midbar, though, Beyond just the, the solitude, the distraction, is it requires a lot of trust. It's a hard place. And especially, as you mentioned, going down to the Dead Sea, we sometimes think of deserts like the Sahara, lots of sand. But the desert in Israel is very rocky. Right. It's a hard surface. And, uh, you know, it's sort of reflective. It's a tough existence, but it tells us how much you have to be dependent and reliant on God. And, the, and it's, it's, it's also, Rabbi, it's also... Uh, and this is, again, when you're there, you realize this, you know, different than the Sahara or other places, it's also extreme in its temperatures. Yeah. I mean, it's very hot in the day and it can be freezing at night. You have this vast, you know, and mm -hmm. so it's also a time, you know, these deserts can be a time of extremes. Right. And, uh, you know, actually the, you know, in Psalms, you know, mentions, uh, I think it's uh, Psalm 126. The afikim in the negative is the Hebrew, which afikim is actually this rush of water that could just, uh, you know, come out of nowhere. You know, suddenly no water and you have this flash flood. It could actually be very dangerous because Psalms actually seizes the hope that the water could just carry us away. Mm. And, you know, carry us in that case, you know, back to Israel. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a place of unpredictability. Right. Uh, and it's the, it's the notion of just sort of not knowing and you just sort of have to put your trust into it. And I think, you know, many of us, particularly in the modern world, we're very uncomfortable with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You know, we like to know everything. We like to have, you know, our lives completely organized. But when everything is so predictable, you don't have uncertainty, it's hard to change yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's actually that notion sometimes with wow. just not knowing the uncertainty is where you're open to more change uh, and open to more trust. Hmm. Um, and that's, uh, you know, I think also the, you know, the key to the, as again, not a literal desert, but, uh, the, yeah. uh, the literal desert too, but a place of, you know, place of uncertainty, but a place, you know, to sort of eliminate the distractions as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a place that, you know, you're leaving one place and heading to another as well, that uh, there is still a destination. Mm -hmm. So good. So good. Folks, we are studying tonight with Rabbi Jason Herman. He's the spiritual leader at Hudson Yards Synagogue, formerly known as the West Side Jewish Center, right in the heart of New York City. He serves in leadership with our dear friend, Rabbi Joseph uh, Potasnik, who we just absolutely love. And uh, and uh, what, what, a, what a comedic genius he is. I won't even try to compete. <laughs> Oh my goodness gracious. Uh, and um, we're so great, grateful to be studying tonight the book of Numbers. We've got so many great folks with us tonight from all over the country. We're going through, we're understanding we're in a wilderness time. It's a season of transition. We don't like wildernesses. They're uncomfortable. They're unsettling, but they are also invitations for growth, invitations for change. So they get there and in chapter one, all of a sudden, 
they begin a lot of listing. There's a lot of lists. There's a lot of description of tribes. Talk to us what's going on here. All right. So what we're doing mostly in this, uh, you know, beginning portion is it's laying out the structure of the camp, the way in which the Israelites were camped around the tabernacle, the Mishkan, you know, which putting God at its center. And I think what's, you know, really fascinating is we're actually, might be the first occurrence in history, at least that I'm aware of, of having a flag. Each tribe had its place in the camp, you know, three tribes in each of the four directions, but each tribe camped by family with their flag, the flag of the tribe. What does the flag represent? Each flag had a color, it had a symbol of the tribe. And I think for me, the flag sort of says, this is where you belong. And I think, you know, especially in the desert, it's hard to know where you belong. And I think many people go through life knowing where's my place. Wow. And knowing that there's a flag there kind of says, you belong here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we began praying for our brothers and sisters in Israel. And the talk about the tragedies throughout Jewish history, I think, you know, part of actually the miracle of modern Israel is that for most of the last couple thousand years, Jews never really knew where we belonged. You know, we didn't really fit in. We were living in Europe, but not of Europe. We were living throughout the Muslim world, but not really of the Muslim world. And finally, you can put that Israeli flag up and say, you know, here's a place where you actually really belong. And it comes with it, that feeling, you know, just not something you need to be ashamed of anymore. And it, you know, instills a sense of pride when you can look up and see a flag. And I think many of us, we see the flag of our own country, you know, here in the United States, it tells us something. It says, this is mine, I belong here. And uh, there's a certain hope that comes with that. And I think the first you know, introduction we see flags is really you know, exactly marks the spot. This is where your tribe is. This is your spot in this camp. And uh, you know, I think we can you know take a powerful lesson. You know, every time we see a flag flying, knowing it actually says you belong here. Folks, many of us are in the midst of returning. You showing up here to Bishop and the Rabbi. You tuning into Torah Tuesdays is you saying, you know what? Rome is not my mother. Rome is not my spiritual mother. Jerusalem is my mother. And yes, we have theological differences as Christians uh, with our precious Jewish brothers and sisters. We don't minimize those differences. We don't pretend they don't exist. Uh, but we do recognize that there's probably 90% that we agree on. So let's learn together what we agree on. Let's cooperate with what we agree on. And let's trust Hashem uh, to reveal layat layat step by step uh, all the things that we are are together still learning and still growing through so so powerful rabbi this issue of wilderness of journey of returning home and then once you're home finding that flag uh finding that place where you belong and and all of us are returning home in a sense mm -hmm. right uh, i think that's you know, exactly true. And I would, uh, just in terms of speaking of exile, it's just, you know, also just a beautiful, you know, notion that, you know, God actually says that uh, God will return with us. Actually, we went into exile. God went into exile with us. And God accompanies on this journey home. That I yeah. uh, think, you know, maybe God is only in one place, but God is actually with us. And when we come home, God comes home with us. Uh, wow. and I think that's just beautiful. Right. Beautiful. I remember Moses' prayer, right? He says, because Hashem says, I'll send my angel with you. Mm -hmm. and, and Moshe prays. He says, no, I want you. Yeah, if your presence doesn't go, we're, <laughs> we're not going. Oh and that's that's so beautiful. In Deuteronomy, God actually says, I will return, like I will return you. As opposed to, you know, I'm not just bringing you back, I'm going with you. So it's a powerful, uh, you know, image. Rabbi, we come, first of all, everybody hit the share button, folks. That's your one job tonight. <laughs> Please hit the share button, get the word out. And what a great crowd we've got in the room tonight from all over. Uh, and um, uh, Rabbi, uh, take us through now, uh, finally, our, our probably our last section we have time for. The time always goes so fast. But talk to us about the Levites, because we come to chapter three and we're introduced to the Levites. Uh, and of course, for our community, we, we love to sing. We love singing and tambourines and instruments and all of this. And the Levites were these wonderful folks who in the temple were able to minister to Hashem. Right. A very special tribe. Tell us about the Levites. 
So I think it's, you know, before you get to the, like, you know, the Levites had two primary tasks. They were the one hand, they were the builders. You know, they're actually the ones that put up the tabernacle. They're the ones that are, you know, had the construction skills to build places for God. And as you rightfully said, they're also the people who were the ones that sang and add music, you know, to our spiritual and religious lives. But I think it's worth, you know, looking a little bit of the history of this tribe because, not always is actually pretty. So starting with Levi himself, the patriarch of the tribe of Levite, comes from Levi. You know, our first real introduction to Levi is with his brother Shimon, goes and attacks the people of Shechem, murders the whole city in order to rescue their sister Dina, who had been taken captive by the prince of Shechem. You look, you know, generations later, Moses, who is the descendant of Levi. But the very first act that we see Moses doing, he kills an Egyptian in defense of another Jew, but there's the killing that happens. And then Pinchas, who is Aaron, Moses' brother's grandson, in an act of zealotry, goes and kills the prince of the tribe of Shimon, who was committing immoral, illicit acts in front of the tabernacle, in front of God, in front of the whole people. So almost, and also, you know, probably, you know, most important is when they had the sin of the golden calf and Mm -hmm. retribution needed to be, Moses grabs the tribe of Levi to bring them to actually execute judgment against their their brothers at this time. So in a sense, it's weird that this tribe has this very violent streak that comes with it. Mm. And you want to use it because they're driven with a certain fire. They're driven with a certain passion. Wow. That history comes with it. But what happens is, and it starts really right around now, it really completes when you get to Pinchas later in the book of Numbers, because you don't really see the tribe being violent again. But it actually takes that fire, takes that passion, their drive to do something on behalf of God and rechannels it. That fire that burns within them, that had such a violent history, could actually also be put to a different service of music and building. And to, you know, sort of, it's sort of as a, you know, an example for us to sort of locate the fire in our belly. That sort of, that sometimes that drive the anger. Sometimes we have anger on behalf of God, but rechannel it into something that actually can uplift us uh, as well. Uh, and I think that's something, you know, unique and special about the tribe of Levi, uh, you know, that tells us how that, you know, that fire can totally be transformed, uh, particularly in this period. So, Rabbi, uh, let me, let me, let me toss a couple of questions at you here. Help us understand, because this is something I've, I've never been able to get clear on. Um, the difference, is there a difference? What is the difference between the tribe of Levi or Levi and the Kohanim? So the Kohanim are a subset of the tribe of Levi. They're a subset. Uh, yeah, they're a subset. So you have Levi and all his descendants. One of Levi's descendants was Aaron, who was Moses' brother. So in the Kohanim are just the descendants of Aaron. And actually, more specifically, we learn later, they're just the descendants of Pinchas, who's Aaron's grandson. You know, Pinchas gets that reward. Aaron had the sort of the gift of the priesthood for his generation and for his children. Pinchas' grandson is given the gift of priesthood for eternity. It's all the descendants of Pinchas become the priests, uh, you know, into the future. You know, they link to Aaron as a priest. Right. Because the only tribe that we know for certain, for absolute certain, now I think it's interesting because in modern times now we've found the Bene Menashe in India and we can we can debate if there are some other tribes we're finding. Right. But heretofore, the only tribe that we knew in specifically were, and this is where I get confused, were the tribe of Levi or the, the Kohanim and because at the Kotel annually, when you have the beer cot Kohanim, and for all you mm-hmm. Star, Star Trek fans, that's where that's where uh, Leonard Nimoy got. Yeah, yeah. it was <laughs> right. So, are they? Are okay. You said that Cohens are a subset of Levi, mm-hmm. but so. When they when they call for the priests at the at the blessing, is that all 
anybody who's a Levi or no, only they're all, at that point the priestly blessing is done strictly by just the Kohanim, you know, just, just that, the Kohanim, just that subset, exactly. Okay, so then why, why in the Shabbat service mm -hmm. is there a spot that they look for a, a levy, a Levi? Right. So generally, actually, when we, you know, we call people, you know, to the Torah when we read the Torah and you know Shabbat, we read we call seven aliyot, and aliyah is going right. up. But uh, originally it was actually done as people would actually read their own. And, you know, whoever would go first was usually a place of honor. And, you know, it's always great to go first. But uh, so sometimes people would actually, it's maybe not a nice history, people would fight about who gets to go first. So we wanted to minimize fights. So we said, okay, we're going to give honor not to anyone for who they are, but we'll give it, to, you know, to a particular cast of people, the people who actually served in the Beit HaMikdash, served in the temple in ancient times, they'll go first. That's the Kohen. Okay. So the Kohen always gets to go first if there is a Kohen. Then we know that Kohen was a subset of Levi, so who goes second is a Levi will go second. Okay. And in fact, if there's no Levi, the Kohen gets to go twice because he counts as a Levi because there is a subset of Levi. So the Kohen can get first and then the Kohen goes again second if there's no one who's just a Levi. And then everyone else can follow at that point because someone has already gone first. Uh, but we give that honor to the Kohen to go first, and not only in terms of coming to the Torah, but there are a number of places where we want to show honor to that ancestry, you know, particularly to Aaron, uh, who is, you know, Moshe was actually the prophet. His job is to speak to God, but Aaron was really the man of the people. Mm -hmm. uh, and people loved him, and he was known for bringing peace to the people. So you think like, okay, why are we giving this honor to the Kohen? Why Aaron's son as opposed to somebody else? Because Aaron actually, the whole idea is we don't want people fighting over who goes first. And Aaron was the peacemaker. So let one of his descendants, you know, as a per, ho hopefully potential peacemaker as well, sort of say, we're trying to make peace between people here. Amazing. Well, I, one of the times I, I always love to be in Jerusalem, but when I get to be at the Kotel on the day of the beer cut Kohanim and you oh, see- right. yeah thousands and thousands of these descendants. Uh, mm -hmm. It's absolutely fascinating. Rabbi, it's been an amazing time studying with you and learning from you tonight. Thank we you are so it. grateful. Uh, before we sign off tonight, let me give you the last word. We're here in the book of Numbers. We're, we're talking about finding our flag, finding our place. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, coming out of wilderness. Uh, uh, just bring us uh, a last thought tonight as we as we go forth this week. So I think I'll leave you just, uh, you know, all of us with the thought, you know, we're coming up on the holiday of Shavuot, which is actually the holiday that celebrates the giving of the Torah, the giving of this Bible that we've been learning and studying together. Uh, but what's fascinating is actually the Torah itself never identifies Shavuot as the date of the giving of the Torah. The rabbis identify it, you know, based on the assumption that you're counting 50 days from Passover. The rabbis call it Zman Matan Torah Tena, but the Torah itself never gives that date. So you want to ask why? Like, why does the Torah not say this is the date the Torah was given? Because I think perhaps the Torah wants to tell us, on the one hand, we're going to celebrate the Torah, we're celebrating it as, it's as a gift, but it maybe tells us that every day is really a day that we can receive God's word. And every day is a day that we can open it up and experience it anew. And every day should be and think of God's word in the Torah as a gift. Mm. It's a gift not given just one day. It's a gift that's given every day. Mm. And uh, I bless us all that we're able to receive the gift of having God in our lives, the gift of hopefully getting the blessings of God's peace, you know, here and in Israel and in Jerusalem. And again, our thoughts and prayers are with everyone over there and over here, and God should be with us all. And thank you again. Amen. Amen. Rabbi, it has been a joy and an honor to have you with us tonight. Thank you so, so very much for your Thank time. You for having me. We know how precious time is. And so we're, we're really honored to have you with us tonight. And family, it's been great to be together tonight. What an amazing group we've had from all across the country and several from around the world. Join us tomorrow night, 6 p.m. for the Sh uh, Shabbat Brachot, Sunday, Sunday morning, message from the tab.org. And then Tuesday, our Torah Tuesdays at 12. If you are not a part of that, just email us, or not email, go to the website, TorahTuesdays.com, TorahTuesdays.com. And uh, there's no charge, but you'll be sent the link for the private Torah Bible study. We have, we have close to 100 people studying every single week together 
for Torah Tuesdays. It's your last chance to hit the share button. So do that and get the word out and make sure folks that we keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. God bless you.